And now with us uh, in the studio is journalist Carolyn Robinson, who's lived in Beirut and across the Middle East. Carolyn, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Give us the background to this unfolding crisis in Lebanon. What's the history behind it? I think Rami Hori touched on that very well. Uh, these tensions do go back decades and even longer. And uh, Lebanon has always been a, a kind of a proxy playing field for everyone to fight out their own internecine battles. So, uh, well, that's what we're seeing again, I think, and, and it can continue on. The, the, the key thing is, how can they keep it together? Is, are we going to see a, a big step forward in, in the violence? Uh, or is this just going to bubble along like it does? Lebanon has an amazing ability to do this. So, I, don't, I you know, this is Absolutely. A that's a very good point. But, I mean, you know, to an outsider looking in, it just seems like there's so many groups and constantly shifting sort of alliances. What, what's it mainly about? Big question, eh? Yeah, it sure is. I, I mean, I, when I lived there, I was always amazed that they managed to keep it together. Uh, the Lebanese have a saying that we'll just sleep, uh, sweep up the glass and go on with our lives. I think that that's why there hasn't been an Arab Spring, so to speak, in the same way that we saw in mm. Egypt and, and across the North Africa. And, of course, in, in the middle of all of that is, is a refugee problem. Mm. That is another destabilizing factor because uh, not only have the Palestinian refugees been there for decades and decades, now we've got the Syrians coming across as well. How much can this tiny little country of three million people hold? How, much, how many different struggles and tensions and conflicts can it, can it hold? It's one of the most complicated pieces of geography on the planet, I would now, say. Now, now give us a sense of where this bomb exploded today. What's the, um, what's the geographical composition? Mm. Is it government buildings mm. and, and all of that? Well, tell us a bit about where yeah. it took place. It's right downtown. It's right in the middle. It's very close to the government buildings, which is an indication of what they were trying to say. Why did, why did they target it right there? Um, it's also very close to where um, uh, Rafiq Hariri was assassinated in 2005, uh, which created this huge crater um, bomb at the time. And, and as Rami Hori pointed out, and you uh, as well, uh, the tribunal coming up, that still has not been settled. It's just one of many things that aren't settled in Lebanon. Carolyn Robinson, thank you very much indeed for joining us. My pleasure. I'm joined now in the studio by journalist Caroline, uh, Caroline Robinson, who's lived in Beirut and across the Middle East. Caroline, nice to see you again. Um, what more are you hearing about the circumstances of this attack? Well, I think it's still all unfolding. And um, it has been pointed out, as Rami Hori did, that the tribunal is coming up. Um, this has been long delayed. It's, um, the assassination of uh, Rafiq Kariri happened in 2005. This is now almost 2014. And uh, that's still an ongoing thing. So it could be linked to that. Um, there's other uh, points that apparently an hour before uh, the blast, um, the, the, the former uh, minister had tweeted something saying that he was against, you know, what was going on in um, uh, the, the Shia. The Shiites were trying to take control of the country. Um, but and of course, he's Sunni, isn't he? And he's Sunni, yes. So, but I don't know that it would be that. And that I think Rami Hori urged caution because. Uh, you know, you, you tweet, you have to plan a blast. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know that it was necessarily yes. that. And also, he was uh, an advisor, and he was against, uh, you know, the, the uh, a critic of the, the Hezbollah. But so are a lot of people. So why him in particular? Absolutely. You know, we don't know that. A desperately complicated country. G give us some of the background to this sort of unfolding situation, because we know that there are tensions with Syria, with a bunch of other people, including Israel. Mm. Remember how small it is in the Middle East. It is a very small country. Uh, country, three million people, bordered by Syria, you know, Israel on the other side. So uh, yes, I mean, you have the Syrian conflict, the, the refugees coming in from Syria, uh, also destabilizing the country. How much can they hold? The Palestinian refugees who have been there for decades. And then you have the ongoing struggle uh, against uh, Israel, which there's been some str um, uh, issues around the border just recently. So it it's contributes to the instability of the country. And how it holds together is a miracle. <laughs> That's a good point, and we shall be closely watching this story um, unfolding in this, as you said, geographically very complex country. Uh, Carolyn Robinson, thank you very much indeed. That for the moment, but we'll try and get back to that later. Well, I'm joined now by journalist Carolyn Robinson, who has lived in Beirut and across the Middle East. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Now, there seems to be a fault line running right the way from Lebanon all the way down to the Gulf states between Shia and Sunni. This just part of this? 
Yes, it's a very big part of it. Uh, what are Hezbollah's uh, intentions and the Shia uh, minority in the country? Um, for years, they've been jockeying for power. Uh, is this part of that? I'm sure there's some of that. Um, and also, I'd like to just read the last tweet that Shatta tweeted be moments before he was killed. Uh, he said, Hezbollah is pressing hard to be granted similar powers in security and foreign policy matters that Syria has ex ex exercised in Lebanon over the last 15 years. And Hezbollah, of course, is a supporter of Syria. So this is all playing out once again in the battlefield of, of Lebanon. For decades, this has been a proxy war between various powers. So we're not really talking about religion. We're talking about power. Yes, actually, it's a good point because it is, of course, religious based, but it is power as well. Uh, this is a confessional country. The, the president, the prime minister, and the speaker of, of uh, parliament, they're all different confessions, as, you, as, you, as they say. So uh, who's going to be um, running the country? If you actually did a census in Lebanon, you'd find that it doesn't even match the current makeup of the country. So uh, would you say that Christians have uh, much more power than they represent? Yes, because most of the Christian population has left, and so um, this was divided up uh, after World War II, and at the time it, it did represent the Christian majority, um, a large minority, um, and, but not anymore. So um, they're in the backdrop of this. There's many things in the backdrop. There's also the refugees that are pouring across the border from Syria. It's been more than a million refugees from Syria, Sunni, and that's altered the demographics of the country. This is a little country, three million. Uh, there's another million people, another million Sunnis. I think probably Hezbollah is feeling threatened on that. Indeed. So, so Lebanon appears to be almost like the lymph node of the, the body of the Middle East, where everything seems to filter through there and sometimes either erupts in uh, or, or or filters it out. Well, it's amazing uh, also because they have not had a proper Arab Spring as some of the other countries have across North Africa, and I don't think they can afford to. They have so many other tensions and underlying issues involved. I mean, let's not forget, there's the um, whole conflict with uh, Israel right on the southern border. How much pressure does Israel put on that fault line? Well, you, you can, it depends on who you ask. Um, if you ask Lebanese, uh, various ones, they'll, uh, many of them, I bet, today are talking and saying it's, it, Israel's behind this because you can't tell. Let's also not forget that the uh, tribunal for the Rafiq Hariri assassination that happened nine years ago is only just now, once again, going um, before the justices. They have not resolved these assassinations, and he's only the most prominent of many in the last decade. So um, some people would have said that Israel organized this. I'm not saying that, but it, you'll hear that. It depends on who you ask. But And yet Syria, though, has actually really kind of almost put a, a sharp elbow into Lebanon in terms of actually uh, what is going on. I mean, Le Lebanon was sort of had this uneasy pattern of, of living with all these different uh, sects and groups. But Syria is really pushing things beyond, uh, you know, what they can, uh, the capacity they have. Sure, because... Um, uh, Syria um, ran uh, Lebanon for years, and they only pulled out in 2005. And they only, I think, they only got an embassy uh, between the two countries um, in the last few years. So they've really considered Lebanon as part of Syria. So that has that mindset hasn't really changed. What about the Lebanese people themselves? You lived there. Mm. Uh, what's it like in Beirut? They have an amazing uh, personality and, and overall demeanor. Uh, they've gone through so much, so many different um, wars fought on their territory. Um, often I heard people say uh, after after a bomb blast, they just swept up the glass and kept on going. You know, they have a very very stoic and a very uh, um, um, joie de vivre, if you will, of, of carrying ahead. So they're really amazing people that, um, you know, are really going through a lot. Okay. Thanks very much indeed for joining us.